Your drafts are almost here. Make sure you are swagging out if you're the champ. Go to fantasychamps.com. Get yourself an awesome trophy, an awesome belt, and here's the kicker. If you add one of the bling rings or the brand new black and gold stunner rings that are awesome, they are $60, you put that and a trophy in your cart, use the code free ring, and you're going to get that ring, well, just like it says, free? for free. Go to fantasychamps.com, you fantasy champions. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Monday episode of the Fantasy Footballers. Jason Moore is here. Mike, the Fantasy Hitman present, accounted for, backwards cap and all. Is my hat on backwards? <laughs> <laughs> now, so, see, I have been a little bit curious. I'm Andy Holloway, by the way. Um, you, you got a haircut. Yes. I know this, to be true, yes. because uh, you came in and we, we noticed it. Uh, but we only noticed it because of the sides because yeah. you you continue to wear your caps. That's right. Are yeah. you just waiting to debut this for the live show? I mean, what is the – Well, the an underrated part of, of a haircut when you when you have a short hair do, <laughs> you, look, you look better in the hat once the hair is cut too. So – You do. Yeah, I mean – This is – it's all just part of it, man. Yeah, but I, you just haven't really – you know, you're not breaking it out on the show. Some say – Are we not showering? Oh no! This is I'm fresh out of the shower okay. today. And proud, proud of you, man. It's I've been told it's too sexy. Oh, I don't doubt it, <laughs> and I too hate that. Dude, sexy. This is like you're like a bodybuilder with a shirt on. There's no. That's just <laughs> stupid. Why do it? You know you've got right. you've he's got doing it for locks. us. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm I am protecting you guys. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm a hat man. Yeah. No, you got a nice head of hair under yeah, there. Oh yeah. I, do. <laughs> I bet you anything. Um, we got a breakouts episode on the show today. Very excited. This week we're going to get into breakouts and um, sleepers, busts, value picks, and uh, mock draft and some other stuff going on this week. Very excited. Sleeper is presenting the Megala show live in Los Angeles on Saturday. We will be out there at the Palace Theater. We'll be giving away tons of autographed gear. Um, we got a grand prize giveaway. We have a Q&A live after the episode of the show. We'll be doing our Bold Predictions episode live in Los Angeles. So if you want to come and hang out with us, ballerslive.com, your last chance to get over there and do it. The Listener League, all of the winners have been notified and emailed. So this is, I mean, I guess this is only news for yeah, there, those that didn't basically, win. Basically 99% yeah, of you, this news. is bad news. However. Because the our, winners already know, so they, they didn't do. need to be yeah. told. No, why did you bring this up? But I'm sorry. Here's why to bring it up. Seriously, genuinely, thank you. We had a thousand different submissions, not an exaggeration, and the time, work, energy, effort, talent, character, personality. We, we just have an amazing audience. We thank you. I am so sorry that we could not have everyone here. Obviously, you can uh, you could play in the Megala Bowl, and um, you know, that's coming soon. And the winner will get uh, to play with us next year. So you, you always have a chance, even if your submissions fail. And the Ultimate Draft Kit available right now, ultimatedraftkit.com. This is getting into the biggest weekend for drafts here very soon. So you're prepping up. I've been talking to people. They are getting ready. They're getting set to dominate on draft day. So pick up that UDK. Now, most of the time listening to this podcast is very beneficial for your fantasy team. No, it's great. However... I have to share a story. Oh, well, man. You have to actually listen to the show for it to be beneficial. I mean, that's true. That's true. However, this person did. Um, Justin wrote in, and I just couldn't help but share this story. Uh, actually, Jason, why don't you read it? All righty. If you don't mind. Uh, yeah. No, I don't mind. So this uh, story, <clears throat> not a question, just a hilarious story that may lead to my divorce, says Justin in Alabama. 
Driving back from the beach yesterday, I forced my wife to listen to the My Guys episode, mainly because we were having our family draft last night. I have won the league three years in a row. It's the nice. only league that I'm in where there's no money involved, but it's probably the most competitive league because of all the trash talk, which is very similar to our league of record. Uh, my wife usually follows ADP and reads weekly waiver wire articles, but doesn't know much beyond what she is told to do by the articles she decides to read that particular week. Well, she had the sixth pick, and she was excited to six overall, huh? It sounds like it. She was excited to stray away from ADP to take Tank Bigsby <laughs> with the sixth overall pick, <laughs> and was so excited because that was the only name she remembered from the My Guys episode. She was the butt of the jokes for the next two hours during the draft and has still not talked to me since the draft ended. Oh, no. Tank Bigsby taken in the first round. That is... Uh, oh, no. Because I believe, Andy, that was your third my guy, if memory serves. Uh, and my serves. third. Oh, that's right. Both of you. Oh, my gosh. But so, not... I mean, Tank Bigsby, sixth overall in at least one draft. Here's what I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Justin's wife, name unknown. Plenty of people have drafted someone in the first round who gets injured, misses the year, and wins the championship. So s stick with it. <laughs> and, uh, but just assume your first round pick got injured. She might be in trouble. She, she, well, she might not. It's an uphill battle. Um, all right, let's uh, let's jump in. Welcome to Ready to Roll, presented by Nissan. All right, we're going to jump into another edition of Ready to Roll, which has been really fun to uh, kind of prime you up with some strategies to help you heading into the season. And uh, this one fits the moniker Ready to Roll pretty perfectly because getting off to a great start in fantasy is an actually underrated part of drafting a team. So it's a great tiebreaker between two players. When you are looking at that opening schedule, that can help make all the difference. And the truth of the matter is, and we brought this up on tips and trick shows, or you know, many of you with experience playing fantasy football already know this because your team looks nothing like the day you drafted it. We say the draft sets a great foundation. You don't win your league at the draft because you know it gives you the ability to make those maneuvers Especially throughout the year. Justin's wife. Justin's wife will need to... <laughs> Pay close attention. Um, also, th I would I would pay close attention to this one because this this segment is probably the only time we're going to say it as succinctly before the season, and this is a good strategy for fantasy football. I I implore this strategy of looking at the beginning of the season as as even probably a little bit more than a tiebreaker. I care so much so much about the first month of the season when I'm drafting and redraft. It makes a huge difference, and so that's what we're going to look at is the opening schedules for several players at all of the positions and players that are set up to succeed to start the year. And it's funny because I got, you know, I got an email the other day, and they were basically saying, like, are you, you know, what about the end-of-season schedules as the differentiator between these players? No, 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 no. And that's not a good way to think about it because the turnover at the defensive strength position – you know, it, it changes so quickly year to year. Not just like is this defense good or bad, but how they play the different positions. Some teams become very weak against tight end, strong against tight end, and all of the different positions. And that data, which we put into our in season tools, we really don't even start showing you that data until now see I just pivoted from data to data. Which yeah, do you prefer not... moving forward? Well, data is usually Deta. what I prefer, but he is, he is also from Star Trek. Oh, okay. So you go data? No, I think I do. I use data. Because data sounds like dad da You know what I mean? Right. Papa. <laughs> yeah, I get it. No, let's so, go data. Now, but they call him data because he had the data. That is true. He was a robot. I think he, they call him data because he had the data. Uh-oh. Yeah. That's, <laughs> you don't call someone. It's like, oh, you you got the milk. I'm going to call you Mike. <laughs> that doesn't Malk. make sense. <laughs> Malk. All right. All right. Let's uh, officially. You, you said succinctly. I, uh, my uh, bad. Official. Yes. <laughs> This but, is not succinctly. But, but we also, don't show you the end of season. Like the end of season schedules are to be decision makers mid season. That's why I traded for Dak Prescott. That's why I traded for David Njoku last year. It wasn't, you know, looking forward from the draft day. It was halfway through the year. Yeah, there's a lot more data official 
um, uh, data midway through the year where we know. Right now we're guessing about the first month of the season. Uh, we're going to be right more often than we're wrong, but we will be wrong using last year's data uh, to project it. And so looking at the quarterback position, we're paying attention to more than just how these teams were against the pass last year. Although if you use that as a guide to start the season, Jaden Daniels plays against the 29th, 27th, and 28th pass defenses to start the year and then goes up against Arizona who can't pressure the quarterback. So Jaden Daniels actually has a great start to the season based on last year's data, but we're also looking at over-unders. We're, we're looking at projected total points in these games where Kyler Murray, Tua Tungavailoa, who always gets off to a hot start anyways, I, I do feel like he is he has probably been a little too ignored in draft conversations in terms of you don't have to make a lifetime commitment to Tua. But starting the year, you've got over-unders of 49, 51, and 49, and then a really good matchup against Tennessee. Yeah, he, he's a he's a much better draft pick than I had been spending the offseason thinking, and this is why. I mean, you if you start the season 3-0 and versus 0-3, it makes a pretty big difference. Yeah, as far as your fantasy team, absolutely. Yeah. And then Jared Goff, we've talked about his schedule. Oh, yeah. It's so juicy to start the season that he has to be on those lists as well. Um, and he had, you know, he had seven top 12 finishes last year. At the running back position, you look at strong opening schedule possibilities. You can look at Josh Jacobs facing some bad run defenses based on last year's data and, you know, being the new main man in Green Bay. James Cook, who's Mike's my guy, but faces Arizona and Miami and Jacksonville, a really strong opening season schedule. Um, and then Tajay Spears, and I'll say obviously yeah, slash right. Tony Pollard because Tennessee's running uh, opponents in terms of how they performed last year, they're not good to start the year. So, um, again, these things change, but it's good to know if you're making that decision between two very similar players, you know, Patience is not a, a a very acquirable virtue for fantasy players to start the year. It's very hard to be patient if you've been disappointed with bad schedules. At wide receiver, Malik Neighbors. Another my guy. Andy. Great great start to the year. I, I was getting uh, – the reactions I was getting to every Daniel Jones pass <laughs> in preseason week two were outrageous. It was like – well, he, so were the passes. Yeah, the passes were outrageous. He had a good game. I mean, he had he had a couple big catches. I think he had 54 yards. But then Daniel Jones coming off the ACL had two picks. Godwin, Chris Godwin and Mike Evans have strong starts to the yes, season. Yes, they do. And uh, Jamison Williams, if he is a thing, he will have the chance to be a thing because he's got that same juicy schedule as Jared Goff. And then at the tight end position, a uh, lot of positive buzz around Evan Ingram and his camp performance and his performance in – joint practices he has a great opening schedule I still am I'm always glancing at Ingram later in drafts I know sure I know that uh it's not been unanimous here but I am and then uh Hunter Henry who's been one of the quote invisible men I think in, invisible invisible okay Did that's I, a word yeah yeah you definitely said I invisible I thought he was doing an Hunter joke <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't oh yeah, no, it's just a just a misspeak that we don't allow here on the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. The dad dad told me <laughs> that Hunter's no. been invisible. Okay. Okay? Yep, perfect. I really don't like it. how this is turning. <laughs> you normally have kind of a... Yeah, I've got a stranglehold on the misspeaks, uh, but now I'm just... Ever since I knocked a tooth out, it's really been gone sideways. I'm really yeah. taking it over. Um, this one, you know, Pat Fryermuth is l lined up to have a great start to the season. However, I I would bring to mind that Friar Muse situation with Arthur Smith is not – I'm not encouraged in preseason through two weeks in terms of how many snaps he's got with the first team. We know the tight end rotation in Atlanta was terrifying mm -hmm. with Kyle Pitts. So I'm, I'm actually I'm actually pumping my own brakes on Pat Friar Muth personally. But, um, Good thing you're in a student driver car and I'm in the other seat and I'm hitting the gas, baby. The Muth going to be loose. It, you don't know which quarterback's playing which week. They both have looked horrible all offseason, and now you have different tight ends playing, and the youth hasn't been loose in years. So I'm sorry, Jay. It, I'm out. It, it, season long, that's perfectly fine because Hunter Henry, who if, if my memory that Hunter Henry also had a really strong start to last year. Obviously, different team, different quarterback. But like Hunter's opening schedule. I'm searching for Hunter, and I can't find it. Yeah, you're not going to. 
the opening schedule for the Patriots, like fantasy points against. He was the number for, one. Yeah, and the number two tight end for the first two weeks yeah, last sounds year. Sounds about right. So he's, if you maybe you're in a, a larger league, you're in a 14 or 16 team league, and getting a tight end it just it has not worked out. You're going to be streaming the position. I would check out, uh, you know, some of these guys with with the better opening schedule. Last year, it was when we were talking about these types of players. It was Jake Ferguson and Sam Laporta, two guys who were just not really drafted. If they were, it was in the late double-digit rounds, but they both had such juicy opening schedules. Now, I'm not. that's not me saying we did it. We called Sam Laporta. It was saying these are two players that we identified that could start out pretty hot. And, and I, I would say when you're looking at different positions and schedules, you'll hear this all throughout the season, the tight end – is the position to me of of all of them the most where I care about who is good or bad at like the the teams that are really bad against tight end are just they've got a hole in their defense that they don't know how to fix and week after week after week even bad tight ends they they just can't they just can't guard them sometimes and so, right. it's a choice too like it, right, right I'd right. rather be beaten by Hunter Henry than you know. Uh, uh, well, I guess a bad example. They don't have wide receivers. Well, Jalen Polk or somebody. Yeah, exactly. So it is like yeah, you schematically, said. that just yep. might be how you funnel your defense. But I really do like targeting tight ends that are going up against really bad, like the top five or the bottom five defenses against tight end. Obviously, this is last year's data we're looking at mixed with some of the new year, but it, sh it should still work out with these three guys. All right, something to keep in mind for you. That was Ready to Roll, presented by Nissan. Find your path in the 2024 Nissan Pathfinder Rock Creek, designed to be aggressive all the way up to the front grill. It's like my grill. Uh, learn more at NissanUSA.com. Intelligent four-wheel drive cannot prevent collisions or provide enhanced traction in all conditions. Always monitor traffic and weather conditions. News and notes from around the league. Presented by USAA Insurance. Well, um, we've got a lot to get to today. It's a breakout show, but I did want to kind of ask you your favorite players of the weekend. We got another week of preseason football. And uh, the two names for me, Bo Nix's performance in Denver. It's looking like Bo Nix. I mean, it's looking like collegiate Bo Nix with mm -hmm. the efficiency and the and the level of, uh, you know, the completion percentage. Um, and so I was really impressed. I think Bo Nix was my number one. Uh, and then I'm still going to throw Roma Dunze out there. Sure. Yeah. I am trying to go to bat for him lately. I I am a believer in Roma Dunze and the essentially the broken play in Chicago. I think that what we've seen thus far with with the offense is that Caleb is willing to move around, extend the play. He's made some outrageous throws. He's made some mistakes, all of that stuff. But as plays break down, it seems like the um, like the homing, uh, the the eyes, the homing missile is going to Roma Dunze on some of these plays. And they they had a big connection this last weekend. And just looking at probabilities with Keenan Allen, he's 32 years old. There's only been you know a handful of players at that age and older that really put up kind of prolific seasons when it comes to total receptions. We did see Thielen do it last year. Larry Fitzgerald had done it. Reggie Wayne did it when you're 32 plus and you get over a hundred receptions. But I just want to leave the, the door ajar there for the ninth overall pick with incredible athleticism, you know, big body, competitive catch guy. I think that there's a chance that we're talking more about Roma Dunze than we think at some point this year, and um, we'll leave it there. Yeah, I'd look, say I, I don't hate the take at, at all. I, I believe in Rome, the player, as well. I hate that three wide receivers for the Chicago Bears were being drafted inside the, what is it, the top 36, if I'm remembering that number right, Kyle, of just knowing 100% that not all three of those guys can pay off. That's – that's been everything about the argument against Rome. And it was, you know, betting on Keenan Allen, who has been was still great last year. He was still an elite player. So that's just the question. If Keenan Allen is the one who falls apart this year, yeah, Rome will be fine. It's just a matter of all three will not. 
All three will, will not pay off that ADP. Yeah, That's I, for sure. I, I, I think he's talented for Dynasty. I love Roma Dunze. What he showed this preseason is like he's legit. He's very good. I still, for redraft, do not believe. Look, Rome wasn't built in the day. It's not going to be built in his first. Busted. <laughs> He's giving me a busted? I didn't even uh, stop no, for I'm, it. I'm no. with it. I'm with the busted. It, okay. Uh, well, I'm a big fan of Rome, the city. Uh, <laughs> Mike's a fan of Rome, the player. So the thing is, is, is he is going to be right now to start the season. We just got finished talking about how important starting the season is. He projects to be the third target you know, for a rookie quarterback. And and I wanted to bring up Caleb Williams as my takeaway from this preseason because he had a couple of plays. If if you're just looking at, you know, if you're scrolling Twitter and you're looking at some of these plays, the, the deep shot to Roma Dunze down the sideline, the one that was to Adunze in the corner of the end zone, which should have been a touchdown except Adunze was stepping on the out-of-bounds line, um, you'd be like, holy moly, this guy is so special. It's everything he was drafted to be if you watched the whole – preseason game you go oh he did he did not it was just three and out three and out three and out three and out for you know the first almost right up until halftime when he had that final drive that worked and so I think you're going to have speed bumps in the road and it's what Mike talked about right now Rome is the 33rd drafted wide receiver on sleeper I mean he's ahead of Jaden Reed ahead of Xavier Worthy who's like another rookie who maybe he's the third best quarterback but he's playing for Patrick Mahomes or or Calvin Ridley like, are you taking Roman Dunze ahead of Calvin Ridley? Because he's going way ahead. No, my my argument for Rome is is more that the drafting of talented rookie wide receivers late in drafts as flyers has paid off for me in, right. in years past. But and he's I, not late. Not late enough That's, for your taste, which yeah. is fine. But I think in some leagues he will be late. And I also, you know, you you do want the guy that if he's out if he starts going out there in two wide receiver sets all the time, he'll make an impact. If one of those two guys goes down, He'll make an impact. Yeah. So at least keep your eyes on him. It's not a yeah. prescription for reaching. Yeah, I, I would I would agree. When when you bet on talent, the wild world of the NFL happens. Injuries happen, and you go, well, the reason that guy works is Keenan's because of never been hurt before, though, right? <laughs> but it's not just like, oh, an injury ahead of him made him good. It was he's got to have both. You've got to have talent and opportunity. I would probably be even more hesitant if there was a history between Caleb and Keenan as well. The fact that Keenan is coming over from another franchise and they haven't played together helps me a little bit too in terms of Caleb picking his favorites. But um, we'll see what happens there. Mike, you have a uh, you've got another player on the Broncos. Sure, uh, yeah. This is and they, look, it's there's three question marks, but it is Tim Patrick Fireball Jones back from the grave, missing multiple seasons in a row. And he's, he's fresh, Mike. And, yeah, he's, the legs are rested, very, very rested in rehab, and it, they're like, there's a chance, there is a chance that Tim Patrick just ends up being the best wide receiver on the Denver Broncos this year. Does that mean good things for fantasy football? I don't know, but I just, it, I thought it was worth highlighting where, where we're trying to figure out these, these wide receiver situations, and the other one is I have to bring it up yet again, and I hate it. Do you want the boo? What do you want with Oh, this? yeah. Can I get some boos? Say it. Yeah, Taysom Hill. Oh, that's a groundswell Tay of boos. Taysom Hill. The, the New Orleans Saints are infatuated with Taysom Hill. Not so much winning, winning football. They like gadget guys, <laughs> but they they love Taysom Hill. There was a, a, a report, I think even before the game this past weekend, of of a beat reporter saying, you know, hypothetically, like, if you tell me that Taysom is the second leading rusher for the New Orleans Saints, I will not be surprised at all. He's going to get goal line work. He's he's lining up literally all over the field because they're using him as a true gadget they player. They don't have anybody else. <laughs> they don't. But it's it, – which – with that an argument for another day, it is simply if you're playing on a platform where Taysom Hill is tight end eligible. This is not a, a call for – uh, the platforms where he's quarterback only, if you can put him in as a tight end, it's going to be more of the same of huge, huge spike weeks. A lot of weeks where it's there's just absolute nothingness, but he he will have spike weeks. Like He'll have multiple top five weeks. All right, other news. The Raiders have named Gardner Minshew as their starting quarterback for week Let's one. Let's go. Wow, that That's was a, a fist pump. That yes. was an aggressive fist yes. pump. Yes. Did you hear – you? You didn't hear? 
I didn't hear what. Did it was Gardner Minshew? Who no, was I heard announced? that. I heard that. Oh, that sometimes was the fist it's, pump. Sometimes it's about the other options, though. You really hate Aiden O'Connell I that think, much? Yeah, I think Aiden O'Connell's a better player. I think Aiden O'Connell stinks, and he'll never be good. Well, I think they both kind of stink. But um, Gar Gardner Minshew gave us Michael Pittman last yes, year. Yes, yes, that is the best argument. The, and um, yes, the fist pump is merely for those who are drafting and believing in Devontae Adams. I think this is a much better situation. Brock Bowers. Brock, yeah, everyone. Jacoby Myers. Anyone who catches a pass from a quarterback, a, a quarterback. <laughs> who plays for the Raiders, I think this is a much better situation. Well, and we'll really, I mean, what is the opening four weeks for the Raiders? Can you, I mean, what does that look like? Because uh, if you up. have a, if you have a quarterback situation where a change can happen, so we got Chargers, so <laughs> at Chargers. <laughs> At Baltimore, Carolina, <laughs> Cleveland. Yeah, this is change. This will change. This will change. And neither looked good in the preseason. Um, the accuracy for Gardner was was awful. Minshew is a gamer, guys. But what I the only thing that I'll say is that like Adams wants AOC. So Adams well, is, Adams is a loud man. Well, maybe then they're so maybe they're sacrificial babying Minshew maybe. in those games. I they don't know. could be, or the Raiders just want to do everything they can to make Devonte Adams mad. If you're in a, <laughs> which they're doing a great they job, are knocking it out of the park. All right, yeah. So we'll you know Minshew for now, and then Jalen Warren missing oh, multiple yeah. weeks with a hamstring this injury. This one's big. He is still in question for Week One. He could be back out there. I I made some very small tweaks to the distribution of work just based on him being potentially limited in week one, but, you know, it's unfortunate, the injury. And then uh, we got word that DeAndre Hopkins with the knee sprain should be back soon. The team is hopeful to have him for week one in Tennessee. Okay. Good for Will Levis to have DeAndre Hopkins back out there. Getting Lord knows we don't want to pass the ball to Kyle Phillips and Traylon Burks. <laughs> I don't think you're allowed to pass it to Traylon. Um, getting back real quick to Jalen Warren, um, I – I saw – I'm sorry I don't have the – Kyle, maybe you could look this up. Their, their center got injured, right? So it wasn't just Jalen Warren, uh, but I believe yes. the Steelers – Their starting center did, although they spent, I believe, a first-rounder on a – or a high draft pick on a center. Yeah, okay. So it's just unfortunate injuries to start start the season. Sounds like they need to uh, dump it over the offensive line to Pat Fryermuth, Andy. Uh, he won't be on the field, though. So who are they going to throw it to when he's off the field? Um, MVS – who left the second preseason game with a neck injury? Yeah. X rays negative. I don't. I'm not. I don't want to say I don't care about his injury. I was for fantasy. It does not factor into my thinking about fantasy football. His injury. Let's put it that way. Did you guys see the news on Brandon Ayuk? Me neither. Come oh. on. Oh, I see. This what is you taking did. too long. Just sign something. <laughs> Anything? It just any. Just sign some bags. Like a credit I don't card care. application. Just, come on. All right, that was today's news and notes presented by USAA Insurance. Learn more at usaa.com slash insurance. We're going to take a break and jump into some breakouts. Oh, we did get some Brandon Ayuk news. Um, status quo. Oh, Sa Same okay. situation. That is the news. Yeah, that is the news. Yeah, the, a thing that is forgotten in all of the, the hullabaloo is the 49ers – control the contract of Brandon Ayuk for this year he can literally just get to the beginning of the season just play and play through the contract like that has been one of the outcomes this is just punks of Tony Phil coming out like <laughs> any news nah no shadow go back Matthew Stafford is uh back in pads back at practice so that's that's wonderful news because I love drafting Rams and I don't want them if Stafford's not there. No kidding. Did you get to see the uh, little conversation between Sean McVay and Kyle Shanahan about the Rams? I did. Yeah. The Rams trading for Stafford. Yes. And how like Shanahan and the 49ers were interested, but they thought they had like another day. Uh huh. I mean, it sounded so fantasy football to me. It was great, but it also, like, the, the thing that was revealing to me was when Shanahan specifically said, he's like, yeah, you, you know you like a guy who's good until you actually, like, dig in and spend two weeks deep diving his tape, and you're like, oh, my gosh, this guy's really good, good talking about Stafford. Loved, like, this was totally McVay poking the bear because he was like, hey, Kyle, how'd you, how'd yeah. you feel about when we traded for Stafford? Yeah. And then – Shanahan talking about it. and then and then Shanahan getting a text like late at night that's like uh 
if you want Stafford, you better call him like right now. And he's like, oh, right. no, and, based on my information, I got some time. And, and then, then signed. Yeah, yeah, that's wild. It's funny. It's kind of how, like, when we make trades, Jason, yeah. sometimes I'm like, yeah, who got Tank Dell? How'd you feel about that trade I made? Yeah. <laughs> Breakouts. All right, you can see all of our consensus breakout picks in the Ultimate Draft Kit at ultimatedraftkit.com. Today we're talking some individual breakout picks, players that could become that fantasy darling or superstar or game changer that we individually have some strong convictions about. We wanted to share them with you, and um, I'm going to let one of you guys go first. So uh, it looks all like right. Mike – is getting the call. I, I will jump in, and we had the conversation earlier about rookies are a good bet for fantasy football. This year is a little wacky because you have you have Marvin Harrison, Malik Neighbors, and Romo Dunze all being drafted way higher than rookies normally are. But Brian Thomas Jr. of the Jacksonville Jaguars is being drafted exactly where we want him to be drafted which is on sleeper as the wide receiver 46 in the middle of the ninth round. Other platforms, he's going even later. It took a while for things to start percolating for Brian Thomas over the offseason. I mean, he, well, he was a really high draft pick, 23rd overall. He was the fourth wide receiver. He's, he's coming out of LSU with Malik neighbors. So, like, you know, these two, they're, they're, they're buds and, and like uh, talking each other up. As the noise had been building here for Brian Thomas Jr., Malik was jumped on social media. He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised at all. And it's just, let's all remember where we, how we got to where we are. 17 receiving touchdowns last year. That's the most at a Power 5 school since Devontae Smith in 2020. Like, he, was, he killed at the go route. I loved, uh, you know, just taking pot shots at him because when I was watching him, I saw a lot of basket catching, so I was calling him basket catch Brian. Which was it, it was not taking away. I from didn't the, like that. It was not taking away from the player. It was just like, hey, here's something that you could uh, absolutely improve on. But it's this is all about ADP and the situation of Trevor Lawrence may not be the the golden god that he was promised to be for the NFL and for fantasy football, but he's still fine. Like he's still a quarterback that I would like my rookie wide receivers playing for. There's a bunch of really crappy situations out there, and. Like the law, uh, Gabe Davis got the money. We'll we'll see if he actually gets the production. But the drumbeat of Brian Thomas from nothing, nothing until just a real steady ramp up of he, you know, the he looks unguardable. All of this and just comparing him to the other rookie shots that I could take, like Lam McConkey, great player, didn't have the draft capital that Brian Thomas had, doesn't have the offensive situation that Brian Thomas has. And they're going kind of around the right, the, the same spot. So to me, Brian Thomas here, as he's like a a go to rookie that I think you should be trying to get in more drafts than not. This I, is a great comparison to Rome Adunze. They're both great players. Like even if you think Adunze is better, you talked about earlier. You like taking a shot at talented first round rookie wide receivers late in your draft. Adunze is almost all of that, except he's not late in your draft. Brian Thomas Jr. is all of that. He is he's a ninth round pick on average and that is that's great yeah i i was a huge fan of the, yes you were. of the collegiate yes. film for brian thomas and i was really like we got a uh a whiteboard in our main office where the three of us work and we jot down early my guy thoughts and brian thomas was on the board for a long time but i was disappointed by the camp buzz and, and it was nice to finally see some stuff coming to light um the opportunities right in front of him yeah, and 29 rookie wide receivers have been drafted as top 50 guys. 60% of them have exceeded their ADP expectation, being like the ADP expectation is where you're drafted. Do you fulfill that? Do you get the points that that player normally scores? And, I mean, guys, LSU has been wide receiver you here, mm -hmm. giving us, you know, just – True elite, elite players. Malik Neighbors looks and like also TMJ. Yeah, I was gonna say, I was gonna bring it up. Terrence Marshall. That first, was always my fear. First round LSU wide receivers. Okay. Thank you. All right. Their hit rate is currently very good. Yeah. No. No question. Jason. Um, time to shine some light. All right. I'm gonna talk about a player going only one round ahead of the rookie. You know, dart throw of Brian Thomas Jr. This was a rookie last year. 
who actually kind of almost broke out. And unfortunately, he's going to miss the first half of the season. I'm talking about Rushy Rice, wide receiver for the Kansas City Chiefs. Oh, wait. It looks like he's not going to miss the yeah, first half not. of the season. Season's about to kick off. We have no news of a of an impending suspension. Uh, the NFL often lets legal proceedings, you know, go out, carry all the way through before those things happen. He is so low in ADP. It would not have happened this way if he didn't spend the entire offseason with the assumption that he is – you know, going to miss a big chunk, probably not going to be there to start the season. So no one drafted him. They, they, he became a late round pick because you just didn't know. Well, now drafts are right around the corner. People are doing drafts this week, next week. And he's sitting there in the eighth round on sleeper. Um, it, it, Rushy Rice, if you look at last year, rookie season, he came along slowly. The first part of the season, the first nine weeks, they had their bye week in week 10. The first nine weeks, he was involved. He was a package player. He was out there a little bit, targeted on 13% of his uh, routes. Once the bye week hit, he became a full-time player for this offense, targeted on 25% of his routes. He overtook Kelsey. Remember how Kelsey had this great first half of the season mm -hmm. and kind of a really lousy second half of the season? Well, it was inverted with Rushy Rice. Rushy Rice became the number one target for Patrick Mahomes in the offense. How good was he? From week 12 on, he was the wide receiver nine in points per game, 14.9 already last year. He averaged 9.3 targets, 7.2 receptions, and 86 receiving yards. If for if you extrapolate that out, just in case you don't realize how good those numbers are, that would be a 122 reception season. That's what he did as a the second half of the year as a rookie once he was a full-time player. And now you just look at all the camp reports. He's the dude, like he is yeah. the one. We're, we're, I'm excited for Xavier Worthy. I mean, I'm really, really hot and bothered for Patrick Mahomes. I think he's going to be the number one quarterback in six-point leagues this year. Um, I, I, the offense should score a lot more. I think he's got more weapons. But Rushy Rice is really good. He, his yards after catch was unbelievable. 70% of his receiving yards came after the catch. They manufacture him good touches. He's on the field. He is the number one target, I think, in this offense. I think it's not inconceivable to say this season he will out-target Travis Kelsey that's within the very clear path of uh, you know believability and he's going in the eighth round so if that happens that he's the number one target for Patrick Mahomes going into his sophomore year in the eighth round that's a breakout to me the last report we had on the legal situation because it's still it's still going to hang as a not not something that should drive him this far down in ADP but it's going to hang as a risk factor that you're going to have there. The last report that we had was that the NFL had not yet met with the Chiefs or Rice, which means it's very unlikely that the disciplinary case will be concluded at least by the Thursday night football kickoff game. And they don't normally put players on the, um, what is it, the commissioner's exempt list unless those have generally been reserved towards um, like domestic violence situations. So right now the legal matter the legal matter is kind of just T B D and you know it was a uh it was an aggravated assault and collision causing bodily injury charge and then he had the assault of a photographer, but the photographer did not I think that one went away, right? He did not press charges. Okay. So that one is not I mean that can always be Again, the league can yes. still rule on that. Yeah, because it's the personal conduct. Correct. Policy. So just to give you – because, like, we have not talked about that situation in so long. We're just kind of sitting here in ambiguity. Um, that ambiguity is leading towards him playing right now. And, you know, whether that could mean a midseason problem, I just don't know. Yeah, I mean, look at look at uh, whatever it was yesterday, the day before, their, their uh, preseason game. He had four receptions in short work with Mahomes. Yeah, everything about Rice has – only been the old, the concern has only been for the legal situation and possibly missing games for, for me. So yeah, there's it, no other reason that you would even so it's, worry about his involvement. It's wild, like that he has gone to the eighth and it hasn't really trickled up. It I, he felt like a player that that made sense at the beginning of you know it would you know best ball drafts are happening these types of things. But then, as you're getting closer to the season, I would have thought he would have slid up here into like the sixth, maybe even the fifth round. Of it becomes a, it becomes worth the risk for your team that that this player is he's going to be great 
I mean, the, he is a he is a top twenty type of wide receiver to me. But just has this risk of maybe he's going to miss games. So if you can get him still, even in the seventh round, I mean, that's an unbelievable steal. All right. Speaking of the seventh round, my breakout pick is Brock Bowers, rookie tight end of the Las Vegas Raiders. He is going in the late seventh round as of right now. Are you a Minshew guy or an O'Connell guy? I believe that O'Connell affords us more upside if he matures and is able to do what he does well. Um, but... Minshew is more stable from a week to week basis. Bowers is an eleventh round pick on Yahoo right now. And Brock Bowers is again, we want to reiterate how I still think it's undersold how elite he was in college. This is the best college tight end we've ever seen. Um he led Georgia powerhouse in receiving for three years. He had the most receptions by a freshman, not of tight ends, but uh, you know, all of them. Like AJ Green. He tied AJ Green. He had thirteen touchdowns as a freshman. Um, this was a team that had Ladd McConkey and Adonai Mitchell and George Pickens and Jermaine Burton and James Cook and Zamir White. And these are all players on these rosters where it was Brock Bowers. So also the only two-time Mackey Award winner ever. So I think they're going to use him all over the field, all of the time. You don't draft a player with the draft capital they did with Brock Bowers. I know the team, like, and not use him. And this team looked at it as an absolute steal. We were surprised he went to the Raiders that surprise yeah. was from the Raiders as well when he dropped that far. That was a it was a best player available. We don't need a tight end desperately, but it was he's here. We got to take him. He uh he was only in line thirty nine percent of the time in twenty twenty three. This is a a slot wide receiver. This is a dude that can dominate in the screen game. Um, he he is a an athlete where the ball if you get it to him, you're going to have a great deal of success. So far in the preseason, at least in week one, nine out of 14 snaps, there were two tight ends on the field. He had 11 snaps lined up all over the field, five in line, three in the backfield, two out wide, one in the slot. Um, I just think that Brock Bowers, this is a cream rises to the top. And at tight end, the nice thing is that a small amount of great plays is enough to make you better than most tight ends in the game. And you don't want to put your bet on, okay, he has to score 12 touchdowns to be successful. He he has to be Kyle Rudolph around the goal line. Like The athleticism of Brock Bowers to me and why he is enticing is because two plays can be enough Very at the tight end position. George Kittle-esque. Absolutely. Kittle's a great example. You know, Mark Andrews, we saw him very early on making big, high yards per catch plays. Bowers, all reports have been he's an uncoverable player. He's a mismatch on everybody that tries to line up on him. You don't get DBs on your tight end very often, and if they are, you got them. They're tiny, and he oh, maneuvers them, work. and a linebacker is too slow. So I just think Brock Bowers breaks the game, and his draft capital would have been a lot different if the situation was a lot more attractive. Yeah, that's so I am I am, I am a staunch uh, opponent of drafting rookie tight ends. I'll take my L on Sam Laporta, but that wasn't the one you drafted last year anyways. That was – the one more often you were picking up off of waivers. You drafted Dalton Kincaid too high. Um, when I look at Brock Bowers, I agree with everything Andy just said about the actual talent and the ability, the 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 prospect himself, and the concept that he could end up having a special season. Could end up having a special season to me is totally fine if I'm on Yahoo and I'm in the eleventh round. He can be my tight end. Yeah, I don't I don't usually draft two tight ends. I don't want to do that. He's the exception. But like if I'm if I'm looking at all these platforms where he's in the seventh, I mean there's just you know he's going ahead of just I mean some of the guys we just talked about um, that you know that we have as breakout potential candidates really hard for me to take him there. So I think he's platform specific for me. I I would love to I would love him to break out. It's just tough when you go okay the Aiden O'Connell Gardner Minshew. You know he can't be the number one target. That's impossible with Devontae Adams there. So now he's he the be number two, though. He could. Jacoby Myers is there. He's still one of two tight ends. He's sharing a little bit of tight end duty, kind of the Dawson Knox issue right. for Dalton Kincaid last year. So uh, it's just too costly in the seventh for me. Andy, where are you at with Brock Bowers? Uh, specifically, he's a breakout pick for me. Okay. <laughs> uh, specifically talking about you're drafting on the sleeper platform because in ADP he will be showing. Uh, so right now and a half, you know, he's going at the back of the seventh. Then David Njoku, 
and Jake Ferguson are just a couple picks after him. Are you? I would your, rather your have, level of confidence is is it taking Brock Bowers before those guys? You're good going into the season with just him. I'm definitely good going into the season with just Brock Bowers okay. as my tight end and just starting him and seeing what I've got. I feel like the 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 bigger comparison here is, you know, Kyle Pitts, uh, two to four rounds higher than Brock Bowers. When you talk about athleticism and upside in an offense, um, you know, Ferguson, I still think is going to be somewhat touchdown dependent. And yeah, he will. And if you are out on on Voldemort, then this is your pivot option. Like I, I'm, I'm looking at ADP comparison here at um, average position overall on our ADP comparison chart is. Najoku 806, Bowers 905. So, you know, ninth round Brock Bowers with a bunch of cap tight ends behind him in the draft, it it might be your last shot at taking somebody that has uh, kind of explosive weak winning potential, not just like four or five points a game potential. Right, okay. But I know you guys like Ferguson a lot. That's a, just a belief in the offense, and, you know, they don't have a lot of weapons. I don't have any problem with that if you want to wait on, on him. So we'll take a break. We'll jump into some mailbag. Let me ask a question though before we jump into mailbag, Jason. Yeah. You 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 know, you're very vocal about your tight end rookie uh situation. You you know I don't do it. Even though Sam Laporta was the number one tight end last year as a rookie. Yeah. So in the last one years <laughs> In the last one year it rookie, was a, a rookie led the NFL. Yeah, the, the number rookie one tight end rookie was drafted the best. last year was a bad pick. Anyways. And Don Kincaid. Okay, go on. What's your question? My question is is that is this something that is now kind of like tattooed on your skin, or is this something where if Brock Bowers comes out and gives you a top five performance this year, that this narrative is going to become different? No, it, it's certainly something that would change. Um, th this is, you know, uh, if you look back at how we drafted 10 years ago versus how we draft five years ago versus how we draft now, <clears throat> things change. The NFL changes, and we adapt. We always say on this show, you want to stay water. You, you, you've, you've got to be able to change. You don't want to just you know have everything in stone. I used to never be willing to draft undersized wide receivers. They didn't work right. for fantasy. Right. Now Tank Dell is a my guy because the, yeah, NFL, has, the NFL has changed. Xavier and so worthy. thankfully, um, you know, I, I prefer when it's easy and you, know, you don't have to adapt to change. And thankfully, that will be what happens this year. <laughs> okay. Into the mailbag we go. Bag. Very nice. Uh, Juan in Toronto. Oh, punch order. Started three wide receivers, full PPR. Devontae Adams or Derrick Henry? Ooh. So it's a three wide, full PPR. I think you go Adams there then. Has your opinion of Adams because of Gardner starting, Mike? Like, is there any adjustment to your rankings? I here? haven't moved him. It's, but I I believe it will be more consistent than than if it were O'Connell. Adams is a really interesting discussion, in my opinion, in yeah. general, because we've had a lot of conversations this offseason around where Justin Jefferson belongs in drafts because of confidence in his quarterback and the team and that situation. If you pull NFL players. And one of the reasons we rest on Jefferson being fine is he's the best in the game. If you pull the NFL, the answer is Devontae Adams. That is the answer from NFL players by majority, is that Devontae Adams is the best wide receiver in football. And so we look at it through a slightly different lens. We look at longevity and the age and dynasty and all of that stuff. But I think I think the NFL still looks at Devontae Adams as a top. If, if he's not one, he's two in the eyes of most, most players. So when you look at that argument of, well, talent rises and it works out. And it I mean, like for him to do what he did last year with how catastrophic the team was, it is, uh, it's risky with the age and the age cliff. But at the same time, I wonder if some of the same upside exists in believing in the talent. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, it does. The talent is there. I think we have the data, right? The top 100 players or whatever. Uh, Tyreek was number one. So uh, I, don't, I don't know where Devontae Adams went in, but he's awesome. And I've talked down Devontae Adams quite a bit from where he's being drafted just because you're – you're older. You've got a quarterback issue. Even though he was uh, the the wide receiver eleven last year, it was very inconsistent. But that doesn't mean Devonte Adams is a bad pick. Like my answer to this question, if I'm playing a three wide receiver full PPR, you're on Adams. Side? I'm on the Devonte Adams side, and you know I like Derrick Henry. This isn't sure. me saying you know Adams is worthless. This is just me worried about 
when he's going at that like one two turn area over some of these younger up and coming wide receivers I just don't want to either one of these players Adams or Henry could be at their end and we just don't know I don't want to hold the bag with those compared to younger guys all right uh Gio in Baltimore wants to know one point per reception keeper league Brees Hall in exchange for their fourth round pick or Kyron in exchange for the 15th round pick? That's fun. I'm Kyron. Uh, That's too big a gap for me. Fourth yeah. rounders are still really. Fourth rounders right now, if I were to read you the fourth round by ADP, you would be giving up a Diggs, Jacobs, Devontae Smith, Lamar Jackson, Malik Neighbors, James Cook, Joe Mixon, Rashad White, Trey McBride. That would be. Yeah. It's hard to attach one of those names with Kyron and not accept that trade for Brees. Yeah, if, if you were to trade Brees Hall for James Cook and Kyron, I would do that. There, there's there's a world where but I'm Kyron, not sure you do that with Malik Neighbors. And... No, I mean, it, it depends on, on obviously, who it is, but I, there are fourth-rounders there that are worth it. It's a, it's, a, it's a worthy – I mean, there is – Kyron outscored Brees Hall last year on a points-per-game basis. So if they're both healthy this year, he could outscore Brees Hall this season. Yeah, the uh, the drum beat on Braylon Allen is is still very very. Uh, yeah, my dude. Yeah, I mean he is um, he's profiling as a as a bona fide as a tank backup running back that should be drafted, especially by Brees managers. Um, with you know, obviously Brees would have to go down for this to be a to factor in. Like I have zero concern about Brees' workload, but it's nice to know the hierarchy. What's crazy is that every single year. There are multiple rookie running backs that are impactful for fantasy football. Usually, multiple two plus that end up in the top twelve. And this year, there's like no no one that you're taking a shot on because they're all backups. Or Jonathan Brooks is dealing with you know he's not even going to start the season. So it's like it's the weirdest rookie running back year I can remember. There's literally no one that you're drafting right now. You're, everyone is a waiver wire pickup guy when an injury ahead of him happens. Yeah, that is it's tough. I mean, and maybe this will be one of the years where that's just not true. Also, you know what I mean? Like I know averages are averages, yeah. but but it's always based on the real players and the real opportunities. Uh but the injuries. I mean, injuries change everything. Yeah, it'll happen. It could be Braylon Allen in week 2. If you know what I mean, if if Brees goes down, it's it's the confidence you'd have in Braylon Allen in New York in that offense would be great. That would be a full fab dump. Yes, it would. All right, on Tuesday, we're covering sleepers. On Wednesday, busts and values. On Thursday, we're debuting our take swap segment. See how that goes. And then uh, Friday, a mock draft. And Saturday, the Megala Show, which uh, if you're wanting to be there, it's ballerslive.com, presented by Sleeper. Come and see us in Los Angeles right before the NFL season. And if you're not able to be there, it will be the Monday episode of the show. You'll be able to view it on YouTube and get that content that way. So... That is going to do it for today's episode of the podcast. Shout out to the Deucers over there. We kind of left him alone today. Looks like uh, the Falcon is... Oh, he's here. Yeah, must not have eaten today. See ya. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com. And follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.